next, uh, our next speaker is uh, a, another close friend of mine, uh, Pierre Anga. Uh, Pierre got his uh, PhD in an, another excellent school, uh, the University of Illinois, and then uh, took a uh, teaching position, a faculty position, at, um, at uh, another East Coast uh, school, Worcester Polytechnic. And, and um, then one day, uh, Brad Parkinson approached me and said, let's see if we can get uh, Bear Inga to join Stanford University. And so I uh, uh, immediately agreed to, to be a reference for, for Pear. And, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's obvious to all of you, I think, that uh, Pear has been a, just a truly outstanding addition to the faculty at Stanford. And, and uh, not only to the center, but also to the uh, GPS lab. Uh, one of the key uh, accomplishments that Pear may, has made over the years, um, uh, at one point, the Secretary of Transportation had a, 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 uh, an emergency uh, uh, committee uh, that uh, Brad Parkinson and I uh, uh, were members of, along with uh, uh, two faculty members from Aero Astro at MIT. And, and the problem was that uh, Raytheon Corporation was having uh, great problems uh, with the software for a program that was going to be called the Wide Area Augmentation System, WAS. And, and the Secretary of Transportation was so concerned that, she, that he had called for a review to see if that program should indeed be completely canceled. Well, uh, after studying the, the situation, uh, it was clear to us that the software was a, was a real problem that, uh, that Raytheon was having. And, and so we said, uh, all of us, uh, MIT uh, faculty and the Stanford faculty, that, that if we could at, at least show uh, that, that uh, it was possible to, uh, in, in at least a non-operational form, show that the software could be uh, developed that, that would do the job, uh, we could con that we should recommend continuing with the WAS program. And when, when what we did is we recommended that uh, Per Inga and his team uh, take on that challenging responsibility. Well, they not only took on that challenging responsibility, but they carried it out with flying colors. And uh, admittedly, it was not uh, fully operational software, but it did show that indeed the software could be built and designed to do the job. And the, soft, the, the program went forward and, and it is uh, live and well today. So this is a, was a major accomplishment of, uh, of Perry and his team. And, and uh, over the years, uh, with other a FAA activities that he's uh, followed up with, he's uh, generated even, even more uh, tremendous accomplishments for the FAA in particular. So let us welcome uh, 
Professor Perry Inga, uh, a truly outstanding uh, faculty member of Stanford University. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for 25 years of wonderful friendship. Uh, it's been great uh, working on PNT with you. And I uh, hope we do it for a good long time yet. Um, I'd like to talk to you about cyber safety. And it's a complicated deal. And uh, it's in the news and uh, a very widespread. And my suspicion is that the cures will be very application specific. And um, to make that point today, I'll focus just on spoofing attacks on civilian aircraft. And so the a uh, broader attack might be to say, well, let's talk about just cyber safety of cyber physical systems that Bob introduced, but that's a little too big for me today. I'll stay away from that. Jamming attacks is a different kind of cure, but we'll just talk about spoofing airplanes. And my suspicion is that within cyber physical systems, we need to find a signature that is really characteristic of the physics of that system. Therein lies uh, the benefit. Uh, normal cryptography won't get us there. It's mostly about protecting data. And data is honestly a small part of Bob's block diagram. It's the physics first. And therein lies uh, the, the hope for finding those signatures I'll, I'll give away uh, the bottom line here. What we're counting on is the stabilized attitude of the aircraft on approach. So not much pitch, roll, and yaw. I don't mind some yaw. Not much pitch and roll. So that the G vector remains pointing in one direction. And an accelerometer integrated into the receiver of the airplane not a separate accelerometer, not the INU, which resides somewhere else in the aircraft, but a MEMS really integrated right into the receiver. And that provides acceleration in the vertical on approach. And it turns out that signature is strong, and it's a shared secret shared by the accelerometer and the GNSS receiver. A couple of days ago, Brad commented, wouldn't it be good if we could use the carrier phase from GNSS to help with some of these cyber problems. And this is the ultimate doubling down on that. It's actually the double derivative phase, phase dot, phase double dot, that's Doppler rate. And the phase from a GNSS signal that's in reasonably good condition, C over N not wise, is so smooth that you can actually take the derivative of the Doppler. Now, usually that's not a good move, taking the derivative of something that you're keying, a key or a key to understand, well, amplifies the noise, certainly. But uh, it turns out that uh, the GNSS phase double dot, Doppler rate, is still smooth and still has very small errors. So that's one signature. I'll expose you to one other signature. But let's try and take a little bit more of a, a general look here for a while. Spoofing, it's in the news. Get on the internet, just say spoofing GNSS, and it goes on for a good long time. DEF CON. I haven't been, but I'm planning to go next year. <laughs> it seems like that we are the apple of their eye. Uh, I'm not sure if that's anything that we ever wished for, but it's the truth of it. And they have all kinds of you know, really quite horrible things that they're thinking about how to spoof every single sensor that's being considered for autonomous cars. Cookbooks for GPS spoofing. The other big thing that I noticed in the, on the internet just uh, yesterday, uh, spoofing in Russia, they're worried about, of course, protecting the Kremlin. And so what they do, apparently, is have a spoofer that injects the position of the Moscow airport into GNSS receivers in downtown Moscow. The virtue of that is that airports are no-fly zones for UAVs. So the UAV says, oh, I'm near 
the Moscow airport, I need to land and I need to land immediately. So that's a, that's a pretty nice gambit, really. Um, Korea, uh, the North Koreans and the South Koreans have been uh, exchanging press releases for a good long time. And uh, uh, we have been very fortunate to have a lot of faculty members who are, who are now faculty members in South Korea come from our lab and they assure us with no doubt that spoofing is part of that electromagnetic attack. And then we go all the way to Pokemon. I know this is Rudy's concern. How he can go and capture Pokemon without leaving the safety and comfort of his couch by spoofing his GPS into believing that uh, he's at all those locations where the Pokemon are. And, and that really is part of the GPS trouble is that our utility is so widely used that we can be collateral damage either to the technology development or to the deployment of something that's put there to do something very innocent, in fact. And there's more examples I'm sure you can add. So what's special about spoof detection for a civilian aircraft? I already mentioned we plan to take advantage of the fact that we don't pitch and roll much during the final approach. But the tough parts are that when we put avionics into a civilian aircraft, we expect it to remain there for 20 to 30 years. So does that suggest that we can come up with cures today that are so powerful that they'll be reasonably effective that far in the future? That's a tough one. It causes us to be very aggressive, intellectually aggressive, and consider threats that today maybe we don't see them that widespread, but imaginably they could be there. We need to use pieces and technologies which can be exported. Boeing aircraft does not build airplanes for the US only. They are and must be exported worldwide and uh, we benefit recently because the ITARs have been significantly, um, they, I wouldn't say that they've been made much more liberal in terms of what you can use, but they've been made much more clear. And that in of itself is a huge benefit to the civilian aviation community as they look at, at this problem. Easily installed. Do not drill holes in my airframe. It's said over and over again, you use the same hole pattern and you use the same cable run, thank you very much. And nothing else is particularly welcome. And here's the really tough one. It has to be selective. The monitor has to be selective. We, need, we can't afford a high spoof false alarm rate. If we, if we let that go, we'll have done the worst of all possible things, have some monitor go off, and now the aircraft is gonna be encouraged to fly to the backup airport, the alternate airport. Whereas, for the most part, when a GPS receiver loses lock in, let's say, terminal area navigation, the overarching goal is to relock and start to provide navigation data again, Clearly, that's absolutely the wrong thing to do if you believe you're being spoofed. That could well mean you've been captured. The last thing you should do is go into approach. And I, I think of these, they're all tough. They're all tough, but it's that last one that uh, we'll come back to in a little while. So what kind of spoofer should we talk about? Uh, how aggressive should we be? It goes on and on in every direction. Uh, that curious thing there is what we call a monopipe. All the spoofing signals are coming from one transmitter. You can imagine a multi-pipe, a stereo attack from UAVs, but let's not go there. Monopipe is pretty tough already in this case because it's actually delaying the actually received GNSS signals so that it's stripping any signature that you might have put on at the satellite. Well, stripping, it's replaying, sort of, after a delay. 
And um, <clears throat> that's the one that I personally feel most comfortable with. You can go to more elaborate spoofing models, one per satellite, but in my view, those die of their own weight, mainly because we're going to go to multi-constellation. I think multi-constellation is a big deal for cyber safety. Might seem a little bit ironic, but I think it's the, the, the fact of it. Tom, I would love a bottle of water in the biggest way. <laughs> a nice single malt. <laughs> um, this is just a graph showing the growth, not only of GPS, the blue curve, GLONASS, the red curve, Galileo, the green one, and the Chinese Beidou is a little bit complicated because they have them in geo, inclined geo, and MEO. If you add up those Chinese satellites, it actually adds up to 21. Mingguan, I don't know if I have that right, but it's something like that. It's a lot of satellites. And with that many satellites on orbit, you're going to have 20 to 25 in view. So in my view, the multi-satellite attack or the, uh, uh, the what I call multi-pipe attack becomes infeasible. Simply too difficult to put that many spoofers up there. Ah. Thank you. So I try and draw a little bit of a boundary then of what we should consider for civil aviation and not consider other people feel differently and for good reasons. But let's, let's go ahead with this. Now, the number one thing we can take advantage of There was a beautiful paper on this on Tuesday, <clears throat> and that is that when the spoofing signal arrives on top of that aircraft, along with the authentic signal, you have a dog's breakfast in terms of received signals. Their phase is not controlled relative to each other. You've got all kinds of things going on, and you have fading of the authentic signals. And that fading is very noticeable. It manifests not only in the C over N naught estimate, in the AGC, and also in the correlation peak. So there's all kinds of twitching that goes on when those two signals are near each other in signal power. Um, so we can certainly tap off points in the front end of the receiver the AGC is used to keep the A to D in a linear range. And if the incoming signal is much stronger, the AGC will go down. C over N naught is estimated after the correlator bank. And it gives an estimate of the signal to noise ratio on a per satellite basis. And that will fluctuate too. And uh, Dennis and the students working with him have done a nice job on using both of those to actually discriminate between spoofing and jamming. Here's my concern. These are what I call transient tells. So remember a tell, so if you're playing poker, and every time you have a good hand, you start to twitch. So we want a tell, but what I really want is a steady state tell. Because what I'm worried about is that with some of these, simple though they are, they appear for a while and then they may disappear. I think there are issues too about how you set the threshold for some of these tests. I'd like a tell that remains as long as the spoofer is there. And so that's what we're hoping for. Here's the twitching of the correlation peak. I think you're familiar with that. Just to repeat, my problem with it, with it is it will twitch for a while and then you will or will not get pulled off onto the new peak. And if you do and you just track that new peak, there's not much information about what might have happened there. 
So here's the acceleration idea. This is one of those ideas that we flew at first. We didn't really have a theory, no predictions. We were flying for another reason. We were flying with the FAA Tech Center on their Global 5000. Those are the tracks that contain four touch and goes of their Global 5000. And uh, we had um, a Trimble receiver on board, very, very uh, beautiful instrument. And uh, Eric Feltz placed his cell phone on the table in front of him. Eric, are you here? There he is, sitting safely in the back where I can't incorporate him too much. <coughs> <laughs> and he had the good wit to align it with the long track axis of the airplane. And recorded XYZ acceleration. Uh, I think there's a gyro in the phone too, but the gyro has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. Here are the approaches, four approaches. What you're seeing there is a plot of altitude. And what I'm gonna show you in a moment is what did the accelerometer say about vertical on those descent phases, and what did the Doppler rate from the GNSS receiver say? Do it four times. Notice the last one is a touch and go. We have a little bit of flat here, so we rolled out and then took off again. Apparently, the other times we didn't land, but we got down pretty close to the surface. Sherman plotted this with uh, help from Yu Shen. I think we were both stunned. We didn't really expect much in the way of agreement. Bear in mind that the blue there is the accelerometer in your smartphone. So that's like uh, Inverness, XT, ST Micro, one of those, about a dollar part or less. PPP, while we did correct it, uh, I, I don't think the corrections had much to do with the results here because the Doppler rate was really measured that well. And notice that the signature is pretty strong, 0.05 Gs, 5% of a G. I guess that's about right. That feels about right for an airplane on descent. You'll have a little bit of shuddering in the vertical. And the uh, red, which is GPS, shows some fuzz of around 0.01 G, and likewise, the accelerometer is in the same ballpark. There is one bias that creeps in here. Notice where Sherman marked it as the turn at time 2.254. There was a turn, and that means that darn gravity vector swept out of the vertical of the body frame. Well, we assume it's a specific force measurement, so we are... <laughs> so we're subtracting G, but we didn't quite have all of G in there. The inertial folks are relieved. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I think you'll see that from time to time in these signatures, just due to a little bit of motion of that darn G vector suggest that we should get rid of gravity to solve this problem, but there might be some non-intended, unintended consequences. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So uh, Brad points out, hey, look, you don't have to just use a smartphone uh, thing here. We should be able to afford a little bit more in an airplane. Maybe we should actually put the gyro there and try and calibrate it, but all of that is way beyond anything we did here. This was just raw. We said, well, it happened once, certainly couldn't happen again. So here's approach number two. The measured correlation between blue and R is 0.964. Cross correlation from approach to approach. We didn't do that, but I'm here to assert that it's around zero. Missing data out there at the end, but otherwise, approach number three, approach number four.
A crypto analyst would call this a one-time pad. This is a signature that exists for one and only one approach. After that, it's erased. We're never used again. After we looked at the flight data, we did analysis. And it's summarized here. This is just acceleration error on the vertical. <clears throat> and the white band is the estimated performance of Doppler rate as a function of the C over N not plotted on the top horizontal axis. And see that it places us in this very sweet zone that we wanted to be down around 0.01 G in terms of error. The black are the noise estimates for the two technology, the top black line being for smartphone and the bottom black line being for uh, what we call today automotive. By the way, if you go back 15 years in time, Demos Gabra looked very closely at this, and what he called automotive 15 years ago is about where smartphone is now. And so smartphone has caught up to the 15-year-old automotive and the current automotive, by which I mean things like NXP and Fairchild, is about five times better. I don't have any degrading parameter on that because it is just acceleration we're looking at. Want that, even want that gyro out of there in spite of Brad's recommendation because the gyro has noise in its measurements which are attitude rate. So you already get an integration there, and, and we don't want the integrations. This white curve is really the reason to include the gyro, and that's just the error due to uh, the error, uh, the, to the uh, um, pitch and roll of the aircraft, and that darn G vector rattling around in the body frame. It's uh, small as an error in the vertical because if you look at the change in the length of that vector with a little bit of theta, it's not so bad. It's going with cosine theta, not sine theta. Uh, rather, one minus cosine theta, not sine theta. So we get a little bit of relief that way. Is this the only cyber-physical signature we could think of? No, we have one other. Comes from Emily McMillan. And uh, Emily is an antenna person who completed her PhD, uh, I don't know, about a year ago now, something like that. And um, she said, well, what's all the fuss about? Don't you know that GPS signals are right-hand circularly polarized? And if a signal comes from below or for the side, from the side, the conducting fuselage will not support anything other than vertical polarization. This is one of the boundary conditions of electromagnetics. Not something to be trifled with. <laughs> Even a spoofer could just juice up right hand circularly polarized. It's not going to help. By the time that wave reaches the top of the aircraft, it's vertically polarized which can be modeled as a combination of right and left hand in about equal parts. She went on to point, well, there are plenty of antennas that would fit in the same hole pattern and the same form factor uh, that output both right hand and left hand. The ratio of those two, by the way, is called cross-polarization discrimination, XPD. Yu Shen jazzed up her, her hardware, bought a commercial antenna rather than Emily's homemade one, and together with Matea, um, they duct taped it to the top of a van. And then they took that van and they drove it up to Skyline Boulevard, and they like Skyline Boulevard, because from there you're high enough up that you can see the satellites rising of the Pacific. And we didn't want to launch any spoofing signals here. The, Emily's assertion is well tested by just knowing, can we somehow 
roughly estimate the elevation angle of the satellite and compare it to what we know to be the true one. That would be another signature. Not, a hard, not, an, not an easy one to spoof either. And sure enough, uh, that was the antenna or a pattern similar to the one that they were carrying. And Yu Shen's results are shown there in the left. He, he showed that for satellites up high, sure enough, the measured, the reported cross-polarization discrimination, XPD, was between 10 and 20 dB, as predicted, between 15 and 35 degrees. That XPD dropped to 5 to 10 dB, and then down below 15 degrees, it was around 0 dB. In other words, the diffraction around the van's fuselage was exterminating anything other than vertical polarization. So why do I like these signatures? Yeah, they both have hardware impact. So I guess that's, that's actually not the reason. It would be wonderful if, if we could do it without. But, uh, you know, this is a soft touch, I believe, to put that kind of accelerometer in the avionics or ask for that kind of antenna uh, on the brow of the aircraft. And they're both steady state tells. The longer that spoofer is there, this integrates. It doesn't go away. This is not a transient thing happening in the correlation peak. It's not a transient thing happening in AGC or C over M naught. And I just like it that the longer the exposure time, the longer would be our certainty that we're being spoofed. So do we have work left to do? Oh, yes. There's a large issue around, well, how do you want to analyze this in an integrity framework? What do you think is the a priori probability of being spoofed in the first place? And that sets PMD, probability of misdetection. And that is a wide open question uh, at present. We're asserting that the probability of being spoofed in the first place is low, so PMD can be low. Uh, sorry, PMD can be high. And that helps us with uh, what kind of signatures get introduced by scintillation and so forth. Going forward, our whole plan is captured here. <clears throat> There's the Global 5000 in the upper right. Certainly need more flight data. It'd be good to get it in a scintillating part of the world. See what that does to the Doppler rates. We love that platform because thanks to the FAA Tech Center, we not only have a high quality receiver on board, we have a high quality antenna on top. So it's not, it's not a plaything. The upper left, that's X1. That's a homemade electric car put together by the Center for Automotive Research here at Stanford. And we're interested in that because it's a wireframe. And we want to know, is our antenna idea, the polarization idea, really that sensitive to the details of the wireframe. It's not a solid sheet of conductor. It's, uh, it's an open thing. <clears throat> Rail. Um, we currently are doing some research for the European Commission <clears throat> on uh, the safety of architectures which use GNSS for train control. And so we're eager to put an antenna on top of a locomotive and see if one of the XYZ, either X, Y, or Z acceleration reveals a good signature. Actually, Sherman's already done this, kind of. He sat in the train with a, a smartphone that we had gotten from Frank Van Diggelen, which is nice because it has an external antenna and a good capability to capture the data. And even inside the train, he noticed that the signature no longer was great in X. That's a good thing, right? The train isn't doing too much of this. Not good in cross track, but very good in a long track. That's even doing, taking the derivative of the phase on a receiver that's located inside the locomotive. 
So we're hopeful about that. Lower right, <clears throat> we have a visiting scholar this year from Hyundai, and they've given him a sonata Hyundai is very concerned about cyber attack on level four cars that Russell talked about uh, yesterday. And so they've asked uh, Peter Lee to come on out and, and work on that. I, I don't think they invited us to drill a lot of holes in that brand new Sonata, but uh, we're, we're planning to instrument it anyway and uh, see what happens in the automotive environment. That might be the toughest one, right? Now we have degrees of freedom, both a long track and, and cross track. And we have multipath in buckets. So we regard that as the, the toughest of these tests. Thank you for your kind attention. Yeah, John. We are. Absolutely. Uh, this, you know, is a follow-on to our need to try and project out 20 or 30 years, where signal generators, simulators will be, uh, I think, pretty commonplace for all all of the signals uh, transmitted by all of the constellations. So we didn't afford ourselves any comfort based on uh, the, the tri-frequency attack. John, John, I missed that. Yeah. You mean if the attacker is trying to estimate what the Doppler rate is at the aircraft? Is that what you're Yeah, so if it's a single pipe attack, there's no way he can distribute the Doppler rate correctly onto the lines of sight. That's, that's my point. Now, this, shouldn't you be able to detect that to say something's wrong? Yeah, I, I agree with you. What will, what, what will really happen is it will alias into the clock state. So that, that's a good suggestion. We should look at that as well. Yeah, Crystal. Uh, two comments and one question. Oh, thank you very much. The first, the first comment, I don't think, um, I would not exclude multi-constellation multi spoofing. I think that's going to be easy. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make a difference in your arguments. I, I think uh, this can certainly uh, be done. I think the probability of spoofing is one. That's what we have to assume. If one decides to do it, it's going to happen. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And, uh, but the question is, um, you were showing these curves where you, ha you compared the, accel the acceleration you measured mm. with the um, a double difference phase. Mm. Uh, no, you, you, have an you, didn't, you didn't really track the alignment. So, so probably your curves are, are worse than they are in reality. Did you, did you look at the type of errors that you can generate uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, by these differences that you have? The, I mean, the question is, uh, ultimately, if you land an aircraft, if you are off by, let's say, uh, uh, a few meters uh, uh, left, right, or up, down is even more critical, uh, it's getting critical. So it's not that much that you must be able to, to spoof. Yeah? The integrated error over, I mean, by, by just having this differential in, in acceleration, the integrated error uh, must stay very, very small. And that, I think it would be interesting, actually, to know um, how, sm how well we can limit it with this type of sensors. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that we're really targeting anything other than a binary decision. Spoofer present, spoofer not present. Yeah, yeah. I, the, I, I, let, I agree. Let me finish, let me finish. So when the spoofer is present, 
we are going to fly a missed approach and get onto DME to our alternate airport. We're not going to try and do something heroic in the face of an electromagnetic attack. This is not, uh, not our con op. I, I, I fully agree. No, no, we, we, um, but you will have to, to due to this uh, difference, you will have to allow for a certain margin. And the question is, if you allow for that margin, how much can the spoofer get you off the track? Yeah. That's, that's the question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I guess we can try and associate a protection level with it, but I, I'm, I'm not that sure that that's the way we want to go. Let's talk about it some more sure. offline. Sure. Thanks, Christoph. Can I carry that a step further? Yes. This is more reliable. Okay. Uh, I've, I've been pushing some time for, it, rather than simply kinematic models, true dynamic models, using Kalman filtering, Kalman estimating, and uh, obviously you can do that with the partial data you have. A gyro would be very, very nice because then you can sense the, the bank angle, and you know that it, airplanes generally accelerate uh, head up. They, they don't go much sideways, et cetera. And it seems to me that you take the innovations that you have now, the innovations that are coming in from your accelerometer and the ex in innovations that are coming in from your uh, not double differenced, but your GSS measurements that are going into the estimation that includes the accelerometer state, and then watch those comparisons and how big that innovation, because as soon as that spoofer comes on, unless he really knows your velocity, there's going to be a huge innovation. Everyone knows what I'm meaning by innovation, right? And so I, I, I keep pushing people to look at this, and Dave Beverly, where are you? Are you listening again? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, at any rate, uh, end of speech. Cool. I'm delighted to tell you we're going to end with strength. Tom, are you prepared to uh, introduce? Ah, Brad will introduce Colonel Whitney.